Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where the penalty for being late to your job is execution. Our next Reddit post is from Actual Miss. So I'm working for a low-level corporation with about 450 employees. I've been there for five years, and I've risen to the top of my department's productivity levels. I mention this because it does pertain to the story. Management had a policy that latecomers would be penalized, but that lateness could be excused under certain circumstances. I was good at my job, and I actually loved doing it, so I was more or less a dream employee. I always showed up to work 20 to 30 minutes early because I liked to sit in the lunchroom and prepare for my day. Management knew that I was almost always early, so if I was late from time to time, which was rare, they'd let it slide, as there was always a valid reason. Now, some of the other employees didn't get this level of flexibility. Chronically late employees would get written up and not have their constant lateness excused. They'd complain, of course, but management was firm. Our company was an actual meritocracy where more productive employees would experience preferential treatment. Then the company gets sold and we get new management. An international corporation was only interested in buying us up, stripping us down, and selling off the company. Of course, they denied this constantly, but the fact that over the next two years, they stripped us down and sold off the company proved they were lying. New management comes in and makes a bunch of idiotic changes. One of those changes is that no reasons for being late were accepted, regardless of whether the excuse was valid. Anyone five minutes late for work would be written up. So at the team meeting where this was explained, I asked, so if someone is five minutes late and someone else is three hours late, the punishment is the same? They actually said yes. From that day on, I stopped coming in early. I still started work at my usual time, but I sat in my local coffee shop instead of my work's lunchroom. This meant that my work missed out, because in the past, I would often help out by answering questions, even start work early if needed. I mean, I love my job, and the old management were actually wonderful bosses. No more of that under the new management. In fact, if something happened and I was going to end up a few minutes late, I'd just say, F it. If being three hours late was the same punishment as being five minutes late, I just decided to come in later. I'd call work to tell them that I was delayed, then go out and have a leisurely meal in a restaurant, or run some personal errands, go shopping, even see a movie, etc. Depending on my mood and how awful the new management had been lately, what would have been like a 7 minute lateness on my part would now be like a 3 hour lateness. Sure, it cost me a few bucks, but I made almost as much money in bonuses as I did in my hourly salary. So missing out on a few hours here and there didn't really bother me that much. I would come in 3 or 4 hours late and my new bosses would be fuming. There was nothing they could do but write me up for a basic tardy, same as they would if I was 5 minutes late. Okay, so down in the comments, people are talking about how this happened on a much more epic scale in ancient history. There was an event in 208 BC called the Qin Xing and Wu Guang Uprising. So what happened was these two armies were ordered to travel north to defend this other location. However, while the two armies were traveling north, they had to stop halfway because of a severe rainstorm. At the time, the government that these two armies were fighting for had this super, super strict law that said that anyone who showed up late for government jobs would be executed regardless of the nature of that delay. So if they did what they were supposed to do and showed up to defend the border, then they would have been executed for being late. But if the penalty for being late is execution and the penalty for rebelling is also execution, everyone was just like, okay, well then why don't we just rebel? At least then we have a fighting chance. So then the two marching armies just teamed up and organized a rebellion against the government because that was their best shot of not getting executed. <laughs> okay, there's another story where a prison warden, like the penalty for allowing prisoners to escape, was death. But also the penalty from escaping from prison is death. So when a couple of prisoners escaped this warden's jail, the warden was like, hey, I'll just join you guys. Man, that's so funny. What's the penalty for screwing up at my job? We kill you. Okay, what's the penalty if I take up arms and try to kill you? We kill you. Okay, well then I guess I'll just try to kill you first. Yo, what doofus came up with these laws? Our next Reddit post is from Ladybug Gal. Since there's only a week left of summer, I decided to take my kids to the local amusement slash water park today. 
As I've gotten older, the rides have gotten a little tougher on me. In addition, my daughter tends to get motion sick rather easily. I don't like the way motion sickness pills make me feel. So I always take along a Ziploc baggie full of ginger candy to prevent and soothe nausea. This time, I had chewy mango ginger candies, hard plain ginger candies, and hard lemon ginger candies. For those who have never had ginger candy, it is spicy! The lemon ginger is probably the mildest. The plain ginger is just plain hot! The mango ginger is sweet and spicy, but they also stick to your teeth like crazy. They are definitely an acquired taste. As we're standing in line for the log ride, I pull out my baggie. I choose a lemon one, as does my son who's 13. My daughter, who's 12, asks for the mango one. While I'm fishing out a mango candy, I hear the 7 year old kid in front of us tell his mom that he wants some candy. His mom distractedly says that she doesn't have any candy, so the boy says, But she does! The boy turns to me and asks for one. I tell him, I don't really think that he would like my candy. By this time, the boy's mom has focused in on the interaction. As the kid starts to whine that, of course he'd like my candy, his mom just huffs and says, You've got a whole baggie, can't you give him just one? Come on, don't be greedy! I say, alright, and dig out a lemon one. I'm not completely heartless. That's when the kid whines that he wants the mango one. I tell him that the lemon one is better, but he insists on the mango. I warn him that it's kinda sticky as I hand it over. The kid rips open the candy packaging and shoves the candy in his mouth. The kid gets in three quick chews while my kids stare at him. Then, he actually starts to taste the ginger and a look of horror comes over his face. He screams and tries to spit it out. He's jumping around and flapping his arms. The mom is panicking, asking what's wrong. He's screaming that it's bad and it's hot and I want it out of my mouth. His mom tells him to spit it out. That's when I pipe up with a very helpful, it's really sticky. What's left is probably stuck in his teeth. He'll have to wait for it to melt off if he doesn't want to chew. The mom looks at me in disbelief, and I just shrug. Then she asks me what the hell I gave her son. You probably should have asked that sooner, lady. I answer, ginger candy? It's good for nausea. I'm pretty sure I'd be dead if looks could kill. We got to move up in line two spaces though, because she whisked her kid off to a water fountain. I'd like to think that kids would think twice about demanding things from strangers. Plus, it was entertaining. Overall, the kids and I counted it as a win. Down in the comments, we have this story from Punk Linux. My mother used to teach junior high decades ago, and she tells the story of some kid who stole chocolate candy from some teacher's purse. Only, it wasn't candy, but a very chocolatey laxative. The kid had several pantaloon blowouts before an ambulance was called. Because of this incident, teachers had to have any and all personal medication, over-the-counter or not, locked with a school nurse. Our next Reddit post is from Actual Miss. I used to be in charge of the printer room in a rather large company. We shipped a ton of product every day, and everything shipped had to have the accompanying printed label and documents. Nothing can be loaded onto the trucks without this paperwork. Now, this was in the olden days of the 90s, so we had seven massive, four-foot-tall dot matrix printers that did all the work. These printers were temperamental bastards, and if the paper jammed, the printer didn't automatically stop printing. It would just keep pushing and jamming more and more paper into the machine until, if left untended, it would break down. Running this printer room was a two-person job. When I started, I trained for two full weeks with the two current printer room employees. One was being promoted, I was replacing him. It was a rough effing two weeks, let me tell you. One thing that made it even more complicated was the fact that each printer had its own personality with its own problems. Another was the fact that a problem in one printer could have a different fix than the exact same problem in another printer. A job would run smoothly for 45 minutes straight, during which we did routine maintenance and such. But when jobs went well, it was really slow, quiet, and restful. Our company processed shipping orders in batches, once an hour. And then, oh boy, on the hour, every hour, the batch of orders would go through and thousands and thousands of orders would come spitting out. Now, if you were on top of things and kept everything running smoothly, the orders would print out very neatly and quickly. But if you didn't know what you were doing, if you didn't maintain things just right, you'd get a backup and things would go downhill very, very fast. 
And when one machine went down, you had to fix it fast before the next one jammed. Because guaranteed those machines would jam up multiple times on every batch print job. So I'd been working in the print room for several months, and things were great. Then my coworker gave us two weeks notice. We tried to train a replacement, but he was incredibly lazy and got fired, justly, a few days after the end of his training. This left me in the printer room alone. Then, the bosses told me that my position was being phased out, and I'm going to be replaced by two employees transferred from a different department. So, not only am I losing my job, but I have to train my replacements. I desperately needed a good recommendation from this company, so I couldn't just quit or do the job half-heartedly. I quickly learned that both of these transfers are lazy and useless. They'd been with the company for decades, had friends in the head office, and knew their jobs were safe. I'd show them how to do something, and they would just flat out laugh and say, yeah, I'm not doing that. Every day I'd try to train them, and they would just ignore me, chat with each other, or leave to go sit in the cafeteria. They left me to do a two-person job alone. Luckily, I was good enough to handle the workload, but it was annoying. Mindful of the fact that I needed a reference from this company, I kept extensive notes on each day's progress. I clearly documented every single instance of the replacement workers refusing to learn, or even to listen to my instructions. I followed up daily with my direct supervisor, and he knew what was going on. All of my notes went into the company files and were passed up the line. Despite my scathing reports, the head office did nothing. Eventually, it was my last day. This was the day that I was supposed to let the newbies work alone, with no help or supervision allowed, just to see how well they'd handle the job and the pressure. I was, in writing, forbidden to help them or answer any questions. As I expected, things fell apart pretty much immediately, minutes into the first batch of orders. One of the biggest printers jammed, and the clueless morons had no idea how to fix the printer jam. Because, you know, they ignored me every time I showed them how to fix it before. So they turn to me and demand that I fix the printer. I am sitting on a desk, coffee in one hand, an apple in the other, smile and say, yeah, I'm not doing that. So at this point, one of them is yelling at me while the other is basically thumping uselessly on the printer like a gorilla that just found a candy machine. Then a second printer jams. Paper starts spilling out of the back of the first printer. Which, if you knew these printers, was a really, really, really bad warning sign. I said, well, I'm gonna go to the cafeteria, good luck, and stand up. As I'm leaving, I hear a third printer crunch and jam up. I went to my supervisor and let him know what was happening. He said that he not only expected as much, he had repeatedly warned his superiors about this happening. He once again specifically forbade me from offering any help. So, I went to the cafeteria and read my book for a little over an hour. Then, my supervisor comes to me to let me know what happened. The entire printer room is down. Every single printer either jammed up or was actually broken. The company is losing thousands of dollars every single minute. One of the delivery supervisors finds me, all in a panic, begging me to get the orders printed. Sorry, I'm not allowed to do that, I replied. Now, several people are running around outside the cafeteria all in a panic, running from place to place to figure out why they don't have any shipping orders. The chaos took hours to resolve. And, of course, I wasn't allowed to fix the problems. Anytime someone started giving me a hard time, my supervisor would intervene and show the memo from the bosses stating that I was forbidden to help in the printer room that day. I spent my entire last day at work drinking coffee, chatting with coworkers, and reading my book. The whole fiasco ended up costing the company tens of thousands of dollars. Man, the two lazy coworkers getting angry at OP is so funny. What are you gonna do? Fire me? It's my last day. Our next Reddit post is from Tarank. I'm a high school teacher of an elective subject that lots of kids take and enjoy. I build great relationships and generally have the same kids for multiple years, so I get all the tea spilled to me. There was an incident during an after-school event. I was in one area doing my thing, and some students who had been in another part of the building came in and said, Mr. OP, there are people passionately hugging in the other room. 
I follow them to the scene of the crime, and there's nobody there. I do all the appropriate follow-up to see if anything actually went down, but no body, no crime. And no one actually saw anything either. They just said they saw the couple come out of the room, and it smelled like sex when they went in afterwards. Fast forward like four months, and the principal calls me down to their office. The principal proceeds to chew me out for not reporting the incident, because this has finally made its way through the rumor mill up to the top. I tell the principal all the steps that I took to follow up at the time, and that it doesn't seem like there was anything to report. And besides, the room didn't smell like hanky-panky to me, so it didn't occur to me to tell anyone else about it. I rhetorically ask the principal, so where is the line on what unverified, evidence-free rumors I should be reporting? And the principal responded, all of them. Cue malicious compliance. I proceed to call and email the principal after every single conversation I have with a kid that could be even remotely construed as problematic. We're talking a minimum of three times a day, usually more for three weeks straight, including weekends. The most satisfying part was on a Friday afternoon at about 4.45, the principal picks up the phone and before I can say a word, they say, Okay, Mr. OP, you've made your point. That was our slash malicious compliance. And if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.